Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Meredith Langlitz and I'm the programs manager for the Archaeological Institute of America. Today we are going to take you on a whirlwind adventure across the Eurasian continent to the three places that on the surface may seem very different, but what they do share are incredible pasts brought to life by archaeological remains and the fact that they all happen to be under review for bilateral agreements with the United States to introduce or renew import restrictions on cultural property originating from, originating from these three countries. We are lucky enough to have three experts here with us today that will briefly take you on a virtual tour of some of the archeological highlights found in Cambodia, North Macedonia, and Uzbekistan. And they're going to do this to jog your memories and rekindle your appreciation for these countries' many archeological wonders as we initiate a letter writing campaign over the next few days in advance of a U.S. Cultural Property Advisory Committee meeting that starts later this month. At the meeting, the committee will review public testimony about experiences with Cambodian, North Macedonian, and Uzbek cultural heritage as they consider whether to recommend renewing the bilateral agreement between the U.S. and Cambodia that prohibits the illegal importation of cultural objects from Cambodia into the United States as well as whether or not to enter into, for the very first time, new agreements with North Macedonia and Uzbekistan. If you've been to one or more of these three countries before, we'd love to get the webinar chat going. Feel free to jump in and tell us about the sites you visited and when you went there. Um, since we have a lot of virtual miles to cover today, I'm going to jump right into introducing our first speaker, Tess Davis. Tess is a lawyer and archaeologist by training and is executive director of the Antiquities Coalition. She oversees the organization's work to fight cultural racketeering worldwide, as well as its award-winning think tank in Washington. She has been a legal consultant for the U.S. and foreign governments and works with both the art world and law enforcement to help loot, keep looted antiquities off the market. She writes and speaks widely on these issues, having published in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, CNN, Foreign Policy, and top scholarly journals, and featured in documentaries in America and Europe. Tess is admitted to the New York State Bar, teaches cultural heritage law at John Hopkins University, and is a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. In 2015, the royal government of Cambodia knighted Tess for her work to recover the country's plundered treasures, awarding her the rank of Commander of the Royal... Order of the Samatre. Um, Tess was also one of the AI's national speakers for our virtual lecture series this year. And you can see her talks on blood antiqu antiquities, tomb raiders, art smugglers, and the black market and cultural treasures, and specifically on combating the black market in ancient Asian art on the AIA's YouTube channel. We'll be sure to drop the links to these talks into the chat in a moment. Um, and after Tess speaks, we will hear Matthew Schuler speak about North Macedonia, and James Reap will speak about Uzbekistan. After these very quick presentations, and before you jump on Expedia to check out airfare prices for your next trip, I will jump back on to talk a little bit more about how you can submit a letter in support of protecting the archaeological sites of these three countries, um, and we will welcome your questions. Finally, I would be remiss in not mentioning that we are able to do all of this because of the support of our members and donors. Um, if you would like to join the AIA or contribute financially to help fund our mission to support archaeology and archaeologists, please see the links we are about to put in the chat box. Uh, are you ready to take it away, Tess? Okay, thank you so much for the introduction. Let's get this. Let's see. Um, so trying to share the screen. Oh, let me stop mine, maybe. Share. There. All right, success. There we go. All right, is everybody able to see that? Okay. Well, first things first, thank you to the AIA for putting together today's program, as well as to all of you for joining. Again, my name is Tess Davis, and I'm executive director of the Antiquities Coalition which is a not-for-profit that's dedicated to fighting the illicit trade in art and artifacts. And for nearly the last two decades, um, as an archaeologist and then lawyer, I've conducted extensive field research on the illicit trade 
in Cambodian antiquities, as well as legal research on the kingdom's cultural property laws. And as a result, I'm very familiar with the Cambodia US MOU and have had the honor of presenting testimony and its support um, several times now. This agreement has made a major impact not only in fighting the illicit trade in Cambodian antiquities, but also in increasing responsible cultural exchange between both our countries through traveling exhibitions, museum loans, and exchanges. So thank you so much for supporting this and the other agreements. And today, again, I'll be serving as your guide to Cambodia, providing the briefest of introductions to its amazing cultural heritage. This heritage has suffered a great deal in recent years, which is recent decades, sorry, which is why the MOU is still so needed. Um, of course, a generation ago, the global hotspot was not Ukraine or the Middle East or North Africa. It was Indochina, indeed, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And in Cambodia, which is internationally celebrated for its 12th century temple of Angkor Wat, Fighting erupted between the communist Khmer Rouge and the government in 1970 and would be followed by decades of civil war, genocide, and foreign occupation that ended only in 1998 with the death of Pol Pot and the subsequent surrender of his remaining forces. As we're seeing today throughout uh, the world, the Cambodian civil war triggered organized looting and trafficking, which in turn helped to further bankroll the violence. Few of the country's temples, not even Angkor Wat itself, were spared from these war profiteers. And the full story of this tragedy is still coming to light. And in recent years, we've added entire chapters to what we know about it. There have been major investigations in the New York Times and more recently, the Washington Post, which have exposed trafficking networks stretching from Cambodian jungles all the way to the heights of the American art market, including our country's top auction houses, galleries, and even museums across the country. And these stories demonstrate, um, demonstrate that despite the great progress that's been made by both our governments, the US government and the Cambodian government in fighting these crimes, there's still a lot to be done, which again, why the MOU is so needed to protect Cambodia's cultural heritage. And this heritage, while exemplified by Angkor Wat, goes far beyond it in terms of both time and geography. Indeed, according to Cambodia's origin story, still told today, the land of Cambodia was created around 68 um, of the Common Era. And that year, a Brahmin, that's a member of the priestly class from India, had sailed to the Mekong Delta, where he met and fell in love with a beautiful Naga or Cobra princess. And they married and their descendants, merging bloodlines and cultures, became the Khmer or Cambodian people. And you can see a contemporary statue representing uh, their meeting here in the middle of the screen. When these Indian voyagers reached Southeast Asia, they would have found vigorous and powerful prehistoric societies in the world words of archeologist Charles Hyam. While the lack of a written record makes the history of this period challenging, ongoing archeological excavations are revealing more and more about it each year. And um, as I don't have to tell anyone in this audience, it's hugely important that archeologists and not looters get to these sites first, otherwise this knowledge will be lost forever. But thanks to these studies, we now know that even in the early centuries AD, the region's inhabitants were skilled in rice cultivation, they were skilled maritime navigators and traders and masters in bronze and iron. And these characteristics carried over into the historic period um, into what is called the early state of Funan, which emerged around 150 from the Mekong Delta in what is now Cambodia and also the southern part of, of Vietnam. And Chinese texts from the third century describe Funan's extensive settlements, palaces, rice agriculture, metalworking, and international trade. And while archaeological research at sites such as Angkor Burai, which is in the, the Mekong Delta in Cambodia, and elsewhere in the Delta have revealed a thriving civilization that linked China and India together. And during the late fifth century, Delta rulers began to consecrate these religious foundations, um, including temples to South Asian deities like Vishnu and Buddha, using Sanskrit inscriptions and Khmer 
inscriptions would follow about a century later. And you can see some example of Funan's material culture here on the slide. Over the sixth and seventh centuries, the record for Funan declined and eventually vanished back into the Delta as that of its successors emerged farther north in Cambodia. Inscriptions suggest that these kingdoms, which are known together as Chenla, controlled a growing amount of territory with increasingly centralized power. This is centered right on the middle of what is now modern day Cambodia. We know a lot more about Chenla with each passing century due to the growing number of surviving texts. And these inscriptions are in both Old Khmer and Sanskrit, and along with the art and architecture reference both local and Hindu gods. And you can see the greatness of Chenla today at the ancient ruins, newly recognized as a World Heritage Site, of Sambor Prey Cook. The Sambor Prey Cook means temple in the richness of the forest, and it was Chenla's capital. And it includes more than 100 temples, many in sandstone and shaped, you know, very unique shape as an octagon which has impressive lentils, pediments, and colonnades, all of which helped to lay the foundation for Cambodia's next chapter, um, which is the one you've probably heard the most about, and that is Angkor. Angkor and the Khmer Empire did not mark a complete departure from Chinla, but rather it was the ultimate realization of it. The Angkorian Empire arose in the early ninth century when power was again shifting north. You can see the map here. Um, to, to the banks of the Tonle Sap Lake, uh, one of the largest freshwater lakes in the world. And this is where King Jayavarman II built the city of Rulos in 800 AD. And in the late ninth century, this capital was moved nearby to what became Angkor itself. And there with only brief interruption, it would remain for over six centuries. And during this time, it would make a mark on the world that still lasts to present day. From the 9th to the 15th centuries, the Khmer Empire became the most powerful force in Southeast Asia, stretching far beyond Cambodia's present day borders and to what are now all the neighboring countries and its capital. And indeed the entire empire was filled with great temples, waterways, roads, and these in turn were endured with sculptures, statues, and inscriptions. And at its height, the city of Angkor itself had a population in the millions um, and its crowning achievement, the 12th century temple of Angkor Wat, still very much rivals the Egyptian pyramids in scale, but also the Sistine Chapel in detail. Angkor Wat is still the largest religious building in the world, a true wonder of the world today. It was built again in the 12th century by King Suryavarman II, and it served as his state temple and also his mausoleum, which he dedicated to the Hindu god Vishnu, although in later temples it would become a Buddhist temple as it remains today. And again, the scale, the cement scale was combined with you know, minute detail. The temple complex covers over 400 acres. This includes three miles of moats and the outer walls, the, just the, the outer walls alone are some two um, miles long. It's also extensively dedicated. You see just one um, slice of that here with bas reliefs from the Hindu Rama, Hindu epics, the Ramayana and the Mahabharata as well as um, nearly 1800 carvings of the celestial women uh, known as Apsaras that you see on the slide here. And to do this required five to 10 million sandstone blocks, which weighed as much as a ton and a half each. So you really see why this is not just an architectural, um, but also an engineering and artistic marvel. Another key complex at Angkor is Angkor Tam. It literally means great city. And this too covers some nine kilometers square. And at the heart of it sits um, the famous Buddhist temple of the Bayan. This was the state capital of King Jayavarman VII. It's famous for its multi-faced towers. These include these 216 larger than life faces, um, which were perhaps um, most likely modeled on that of the king himself. And like Angkor Wat, despite this large scale, it also has an immense attention to detail, including some 1.2 kilometers of bas reliefs. Um, of course, Angkor Tom and Angkor Wat are just the highlights of Angkor, which includes 72 major temples and the ruins of hundreds of more minor temples in what is now the park's archaeological borders. 
And this too is just a small part again of the wider Khmer Empire, which covered um, mainland Southeast Asia as we know it today. This empire had thousands of temples that we know about and, and more too that are still being found every year. Um, However, of course, ambitious projects like this, uh, along with other factors which archaeologists are still working to figure out, did weaken the Khmer Empire over time. And the Siamese, now the Thais, began to chip away at its borders, finally sacking the city in 1431, at which point the capital was moved um, not far from where it remains today in Phnom Penh. Um, but I hope this brief introduction showed that so many centuries later, the glory of Angkor and indeed the Khmer Empire survives very much in Cambodia's art and archaeology. Um, and this is exactly what we're working to protect uh, with this agreement. Cambodia is carpeted by remnants of antiquity, and, and these vary from these, these major archaeological complexes to cemeteries that are just beginning to be excavated which could reveal how Angkor arose into this great empire. We still know very little about that. Um, so thank you so much um, for your interest and also for um, submitting um, these letters in support of this agreement. The agreement seen firsthand um, over the years, how it makes a huge difference in the protection of Cambodia's cultural heritage and has also done a lot to bring that heritage in a responsible way to the United States so we can all see it here. So if a trip is not on your agenda to Cambodia in the near future, um, again, there are a number of traveling exhibitions uh, supported by the MOU uh, that are coming here in the upcoming years. And I hope you take the opportunity to see them. Thank you so much. And I'm available for any questions now or later um, if helpful in compiling these letters. Thank you, Tess. Um, I, I know that in the sort of the, the survey we took at the beginning, uh, several of you has said that you have visited Cambodia. So I hope this brought up some fond memories for you. Um, next up, we'll be jumping across the globe to North Macedonia and Dr. Matthew Schuler, a visiting, visiting assistant professor at William and Mary will guide us through our adventures there. Um, to give you some background, Dr. Schuler's primary research interests are urbanism, architecture, and cultural interaction in the eastern provinces of the Roman Empire, with a focus on the Balkan provinces of Macedonia and Thrace. He spent more than a decade working on excavations in this region, and his current research investigates public entertainment venues in these provinces. Um, I'm looking forward to handing things over to someone with such extensive experience with the cultural heritage of North Macedonia and hearing him share some highlights. Matthew? Yes, thank you very much for that introduction, Meredith. It's a pleasure being here with you all today, and it's really a pleasure just to chat about a uh, country that I love to visit, love to do archaeological work in. Um, and so, yeah, I have some pictures lined up for you from two sites in particular that I have had the, the pleasure to work at and to build a, a really strong collegial relations at. Um, yeah, so I'll share a screen here just to start. Um, just to situate us first to um, North Macedonia here. Um, let's see, North Macedonia is, pardon me. Oop. Get them, <laughs> get us all oriented here. Can everyone see my screen? Uh, so oriented here, North Macedonia is, as you all know, uh, just north of Greece, sandwiched between Albania uh, and Bulgaria here. And I've had the pleasure of going to North Macedonia for archaeological digs, uh, for a conservation project, and for some sightseeing in between since 2009. Um, and so that has brought me first um, to the site of Heraclea Lincestis, which is down here near Bitula uh, in uh, the southwest corner of North Macedonia. Um, and so I was at first associated with the dig there in 2009 with the Balkan Heritage Field School. I can show you some pictures here soon. Um, but the whole point of the field school is generally the point of um, sort of the, these agree this agreement that we're approaching for here uh, is really to bring uh, uh, scholars, young scholars from and adult learners from the US and really introduce them to the rich um, past, the rich uh, archeological heritage, cultural heritage of this country of North Macedonia. And meanwhile, um, showing them the, the diachronic view of history and life in this, in this region of the, the, the Balkans. And so 
Um, as as y'all can do, and if those who have visited the country, you, you know this, uh, as y'all can do when you visit North Macedonia, you get a snippet, you're able to go to sites like Heraclea and Lekestis down here in Bitsala, or uh, Stobi up here near Kavadarci, and you're able to get a really good idea of the rich a Roman, Greco-Roman, but also before, uh, Paeonian, for example, uh, cultural heritage, uh, and at the same time, pick up some, um, some modern life as well, and really understand how this area has been shaped by many empires, whether it's the Roman Empire, uh, whether it's the Ottoman Empire, uh, whether it's also the, what you can call the, the, the empire of, of communism, of, of, um, of Soviet communism. Um, and and then Yugoslavia, um, and, and so let's go to let's show you some pictures here. Pericleia. This is the site I first started working at in uh, 2000, uh, 2009 uh, with the Balkan Heritage Foundation. Here's just a snapshot, so you can see these pictures in the bhfieldschool.org um, of of students really um, working here at the base of the theater. And this theater is just really quite a spectacular site. It's been reconstructed. Uh, you can, there, it hosts shows today. So I encourage that if you've gone, if you have a chance to go to Bitola, uh, maybe time it for one of these shows in the theater. Uh, it's really quite spectacular. It gives you a sense of how this theater would have been uh, peopled and would have been uh, energetic in the sort of second century CE. But you see here a bunch of students in the field school and these, these students come in for about a month um, and they, they dig the area, they get their hands dirty, seeing this cultural heritage, this rich cultural heritage, and getting a full sense of oh, the, the rich of the, the, the finds, the richness of the finds that come out of the ground, and are able to connect that to the broader narratives of what the, these finds mean for the region, uh, for the country, and how that blends into the larger history and archaeology of the Balkans. Um, so here's some, some examples. Um, you can peruse the site here. Um, and the, the, what I've always been, what I've always been wowed by is really the sort of span of cultural experiences you get. Um, and really, uh, so the, the archaeologists here, this, uh, this team was a team to, uh, field school put together with the Balkan Heritage Foundation in a partnership with the local museum, uh, uh, the Museum of Bitola. And the archaeologists there worked tireless, tirelessly uh, to uh, excavate the site and also to preserve, for example, its beautiful mosaics that are a highlight of uh, North Macedonia's history. Um, uh, similar mosaics found at Stobi, another site that I visited that I point out on the map, uh, feature very prominently on the, uh, the, the money of North Macedonia. Um, and, and so not only then do you have a chance to go to Bitola, sites of Bitola and see um, interesting sites like the, the theater here. So here I have a team of uh, uh, part of the field school team sitting in the reconstructed theater, really quite a sight to see and experience firsthand. But you can travel just up the road and go to the beautiful lake town of Ohrid, where there's also a wonderful, wonderful, um, there's a nice little museum. Uh, you can go and visit a, a fortress. Uh, there's also a, a Roman theater there as well. And then while you're taking the, the ancient sites, you can also take in the wonderful uh, lake sites as well, get a wonderful frappe. Um, and so there's really a lot of modern vibrancy as well as um, snapshots in the past that you can get from visiting North Macedonia. So now I'd like to go to um, some pictures from the site of Stobie. And so I had the pleasure of uh, first visiting Stobie probably back in 2009. And I, um, oh, pardon me. Um, and um, I've recently gone back to Stoby um, in, in this just this last summer, and I will I'm invited back to uh, resume excavations as part of the field school there next year, um, this this coming summer that is. Uh, and so Stoby has a a very long tradition of a partnership with um, um, with American scholars. Uh, there was the excavations in the '70s when Macedonia was still part of the was a Yugoslav Republic. Uh, when there was a team there led by uh, James Wiseman, first at uh, University of Texas, Austin, and then Boston University. 
Um, and um, the after the American uh, team left, um, local teams, Yugoslav teams, and then now um, North Macedonian teams work there at the site. And so Stoby is really quite an interesting site to really see the continuing combined efforts of not only local of, of, of local North Macedonian archaeologists and uh, particularly American archaeologists. And when you go to this site, which is really kind of off in the middle of nowhere under a highway overpass, you see really uh, sprawled in front of you a breathtaking snapshot of an ancient city uh, between about the fourth and sixth centuries uh, CE. Uh, and there's a wonderful, um, you see examples here on the screen here, uh, there's a wonderful uh, Episcopal Basilica like that at Heraclea as well, with wonderful mosaics. And there's a snapshot here of the relatively restored um, Baptisterium, which is certainly a highlight uh, of the site. Um, Ah, here it is. Well, this is a, one of the other houses that restored sex and site. Uh, but really, when you go to Stoby, you get a sense of really not only the richness of a certain swaths, sort of broadly the Roman period uh, in Macedonia, but you do, again, uh, get an idea of what can happen when you have the confluence of, of local archaeologists, local scholars working to uh, excavate, preserve, and publish this vital material when you have that together with um, the partnership with Amer American uh, scholars. And you can really see at Stobie the fruits of that combined labor. And that's really why um, Stobie is a great example to visit. And uh, especially in this talk, we're talking about this agreement to really put into place more systematic protections for this rich cultural heritage so that not only field school students can go in and appreciate it, but the scholars there can continue to do their work. You know, I have, I have not, I've, uh, very fortunately, not been able to see the rat, not seen the ravages of looting in North Macedonia firsthand. But I know my colleagues there have to deal with it and take it into account whenever they're doing their work. And it's really quite a hindrance to the the publishing efforts or excavation efforts. And I know that with more systematic protections in place, this sort of work will continue. Their work will continue. Their collaboration with uh, scholars in the U.S. and uh, can continue. And not only then. Could scholars enjoy sites like Stobie and Heraclea, but also um, uh, adult learners, people who are not necessarily uh, going to be professional archaeologists, but just want to get a sense of this, of the broad crossroads of history that you can experience in North Macedonia, uh, or, and also uh, students of archaeology, students who may be going to study other fields. They get a chance to come here, experience ancient culture, and then see how that interacts uh, with the modern culture that sort of lives around these bits and bobs. Uh, and so I'll kind of wrap up there uh, and I encourage you to visit uh, the Balkan Heritage uh, website and look at the gallery for Stobie and Heraclea. Heraclea is a past project, uh, end in 2012, uh, but the partnerships um, still continue um, with the scholars in Bitola. But thank you very much for attention. I encourage uh, all sorts of questions. I'm happy to feel those sorts of questions. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Matthew. A footnote to your mention of James Wiseman. He is actually also a past president of the AIA, so there's definitely a AIA connection there. Um, our next speaker, uh, James Reap, when we asked him to speak today, wanted us to make sure I knew that he was a lawyer and not an archaeologist. However, uh, James is extremely qualified to be here talking to us today. He is currently a professor of the Masters of Historic Preservation program at the University of Georgia, he taught law and heritage conservation as a Fulbright scholar at the Jordan University of Science and Technology, and as a visiting professor at the Orenburg Institute of the Moscow State Law Academy. In 2016, he was appointed by President Obama to the State Department's Cultural Property Advisory Committee. So he is a past member of the very body we're asking you to write to today. Um, so James is an active member of the International Council of Monuments and Sites, and has worked on preservation issues in Eastern and Southeast Southern Europe, Central Asia, Africa and the Middle East, and the Caribbean. He has served in a considerable number of other impressive capacities, but I'm gonna pause here because I just mentioned that he's worked on preservation issues in Central Asia, and we have some ground to cover to make sure we squeeze Uzbekistan into this webinar. Um, are you ready, James? I am, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the uh, 
uh, Archaeological Institute of America hosting this, uh, this webinar and the participants who attended. And as a former uh, member of the Cultural Property Advisory Committee, I can tell you that we very much value the input uh, of the commenters and we read all of the letters and we listen to all the presentations. So I encourage you to weigh in on, um, on this issue. Um, of course, Uzbekistan is a doubly landlocked country in the middle of Central Asia, but it has an incredibly long and rich historic history. Um, it, um, it was uh, the, one of the earliest, um, one of the earliest of the civilizations in Central Asia. Um, although the Paleolithic period is represented in the first settlements, uh, it was um, uh, largely recorded history began with the Scythians in the eighth century BC. And the parade of empires from the Greeks, the Persians, the Mongols, the Muslim conquest um, is, uh, is, is impressive. And they've all left their cultural resources and, and remnants uh, in, in the country. Um, the golden age probably was that of uh, the period of Timur, Tamerlane, uh, in the 14th century, and uh, uh, his, his empire, um, uh, is, it, the remains are very rich and uh, impressive. Um, and uh, the, the, uh, his descendants, Ulug Beg, really was the uh, founder uh, um, of the um, of the uh, um, Ulug Beg and then later Babur were founders of the Mughal Empire in India. So uh, it's an extremely uh, influential uh, country region for, uh, for uh, the rest of the world. Uh, Central Asia was gradually incorporated in the Russian Empire during the 19th century, replacing the Hanates that, it, that it were uh, ruling the area at the time, and became part of the Soviet Union and declared its independence in 1991. Um, it's um, a, a, um, a secular state. Um, and um, can you see my, have, have the slides changed there or? Um, you know, I, I can I think you're not in presentation mode. Uh, so I think you just have to get the uh, slideshow. Uh, and I think my I guess my problem is I've got it on two screens. Okay, if you go at the top of your menu to the slideshow, I think you're, yep, yeah. yep, just over a little bit further. Uh, okay. right there, yep, and then say from current slide. Uh, from current slide. Okay, does that change as yep, well? Yeah, now you're perfect. All right, perfect, great. Um, so the, um, uh, at the time of independence, uh, it was established as a, a secular state um, and was uh, governed by uh, a long-term president for over 20 years and was a very, a very closed state. Um, tourism was not uh, largely encouraged. Uh, there was uh, a great, a great deal of uh, problems in the cultural sector during this time, but since uh, the uh, the election of the current president, President Mirziyoyev, uh, the things have begun to change, um, and the United Nations has found that they are making progress towards the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, they are. Um, beginning to make major changes in the cultural se uh, sector. There are more than 8,000 known cultural sites, uh, including five sites on the World Heritage List, uh, the centers of Bukhara and Chakrasab and Kiva and Samarkand. Um, but the growth of the uh, heritage sector has been really impressive. And in 2020, um, there were um, only, uh, in, in the year 2000, there were only 88 museums. There are now 127 museums uh, uh, housing more than 20, uh, two, two and a half million cultural items. Um, and uh, the government has been very, uh, become very concerned with the looting and pillaging and theft that's occurred. Uh, unfortunately, much of this has occurred in the museum sector. Um, artifacts have been lost um, 
from 14 museums and they estimate some 3000 artifacts were lost. Uh, the most publicized being a theft from the museum in Kiva in 1992. But in many cases, they found that uh, items were replaced in the museums by fakes, by counterfeits, by the museum staffs themselves. And most were allegedly sold on the market to tourists. So we have looted items, but we also have forgeries uh, and in the international trade, which are uh, really a, a great problem. Um, the other problem is uh, development. The population is growing very rapidly. It's currently a population of about 33 million people, growing extremely rapidly. Um, and that development is, um, uh, is often uh, unearthing archeological sites throughout the country on a continual basis. There's a tremendously growing tourism industry um, and that increases the opportunities for, tra uh, for trafficking, although it brings uh, economic uh, benefits to the country. Uh, in 2020, the president said that specifically that we need to preserve and pass on to future generations this cultural heritage. And so um, the history of, of looting is, uh, and trafficking is still uh, ongoing in 2020. Uh, he, uh, the British uh, border force at the Heathrow Airport sees six large glazed tiles uh, smuggled from, by a passenger from Dubai who said he had purchased them in Sarja for, Sharja for $90. Um, they were de deemed to be from uh, the Shai Zinda World Heritage Site in Samarkand, apparently taken during restoration work in the early 20, 2000s. The, uh, uh, it was, the materials have been uh, returned to Uzbekistan. Uh, in 2014, a glazed tile turned up in the Mayfair Gallery. Uh, it was spotted by, spotted by an Oxford scholar and it was returned to Uzbekistan and put back on the facade of the 13th century monument it was taken from. So there's an active trade going on. And certainly the British have been active in uh, intercepting uh, these uh, stolen and looted items. And that's one reason we need, seriously need a cultural pro the Cultural Property uh, Implementation Act to, to develop this by uh, bilateral agreement with Uzbekistan. There really is a growing interest in the preserving of cultural heritage and a, a, an interest in sharing their wealth uh, uh, through other museums. Uh, there have been two important um, exhibits uh, in Paris uh, from Uzbekistan, one at the Louvre um, and uh, one at the Arab World Institute. And so uh, they are meeting one of the other requirements of the Cultural Property Act, and that's the willingness to share their resources. So this agreement will help in a number of ways. Certainly it will discourage looting and trafficking, uh, and it will also bring more US collaboration, as Tess was mentioning, the collaboration with our State Department and with US government has brought significant benefits to Cambodia and we see that as happening as well uh, in Uzbekistan. There are American archeologists that work there along with Russian, French, Japanese and ongoing excavations working uh, with Uzbek uh, archeologists. And so uh, we believe that, that uh, the US can provide additional assistance in training and support. So I'd like to show you a few of the resources. Certainly Kiva is a, an important resource uh, by legend uh, founded by a son of Noah in 2,400 years ago, probably from the sixth century, uh, but a number, of, uh, a number of empires there. It was named a world heritage site. Um, the, uh, the tiles, uh, particularly, uh, particularly impressive and also a subject uh, to theft, but the accurate restoration are going on there. You can see in the lower right hand corner um, where early wall paintings have been, uh, been restored and you can see the spaces where reveals, where originals are there. So you can actually uh, see the earlier, earlier work. Um, uh, you know, fabulous madrasas and mosques, 
Um, but the materials that you see here in a museum are also uh, the carved uh, wooden ornaments are also subject to looting and trafficking um, and, and, and need to be preserved. Um, again, the, uh, uh, the intangible cultural heritage of Kia is, is, uh, is, is uh, the, the uh, performances, the crafts are all very active. Uh, active there and are, are able to be seen in uh, the city. Um, near, in the western part of the country, the Horizon fortresses are quite impressive. Uh, Ayaz Kala and Koprat, uh, Toprat Kala and Kazil Kala. Um, and they have largely been excavated and many of them stabilized and partially restored, but they are in remote areas. And many of these resources um, you can visit, I have visited these and there was no one there. Um, and so they are uh, open and subject to uh, potential, potential looting, although the government is moving more and more to try to secure them. Uh, other examples of the, the desert fortresses that, that are there uh, to be explored. Um, there's a Christian heritage uh, of uh, Uzbekistan, although it's a largely Muslim country today. Uh, this is an excavation that was uh, from an, an Nestorian uh, monastery near Urgut. Uh, there are many, uh, many signs indicating that these areas are protected. This particular one um, says that it is under state protection and foreigners are not allowed to enter. I don't know if if that's going to solve the problem. Uh, obviously, uh, local folks do, uh, do loot and traffic of the materials, but they're, uh, they certainly are making efforts in this regard. Uh, Bukhara, uh, again, another World Heritage Site that contains uh, uh, many architectural and archeological wonders as well. Um, early mosques, uh, this particular mosque on the left was built on the foundation of a Zoroastrian fire temple. Um, and then uh, later, later mosques um, and uh, opportunities for, uh, for further restoration in the historic housing, but also potential subjects for looting of the architectural materials and, and trafficking in them. Uh, the museums, uh, again, contain, contain many, many items, uh, but both uh, Ethnographic items as well as archaeological items will be subject to protection under the agreement, um, and and they uh, of course have been at risk in museums, but they are also at risk in the marketplace. The Jewish heritage of of Uzbekistan is very significant, although much of the Jewish population has immigrated to the U.S. or to Israel since the fall of the Soviet Union. Uh, but there's a great effort from the World Monuments Fund to preserve the Jewish heritage in Bukhara. And this is one of the houses that has been, uh, been preserved and museums. Um, but it raises a, a very interesting uh, issue. While there, while there are two functioning uh, synagogues there that are all pictured on the left in Bukhara and Samarkand, uh, many, uh, since most of the traditional custodians have left the country, um, the material culture of, of, of the Jewish uh, population uh, is at risk. It's again, it's a, it's a risk of, of trafficking. Samarkand, of course, is, a, is uh, one of the outstanding World Heritage Sites of Central Asia. Um, the monument to Timur and the Timurid Empire. Um, his mausoleum, uh, among others, uh, is uh, on the World Heritage List as a protected on, uh, area on the World Heritage List. Um, and uh, the uh, Shai Zinda, as I mentioned, uh, some of the tiles from here were the subject of the, of the trafficking um, that were uh, found, in, uh, in found in London, largely taken during, during restoration efforts. Um, some of the some of the other art, art, artifacts that are easily transportable are often small, and the value amounts to less than five thousand dollars, which is usually the subject of the cultural property uh, act uh, of, of the uh, of the uh, uh, stolen property act. I'm sorry. Um, 
Shahrasab, uh, a city where Timur was born, uh, has lost a great deal. While the great monuments are there, their context, the mahalas, the residential areas were cleared and huge parks were made, again, um, before, the current, uh, before the current administration uh, in the country. So there's currently an effort to uh, update all of the laws on cultural heritage. Uh, they're, they're disparate, they're duplicative. Uh, they have been in the past and this year um, has been the president's goal to update those. So there's, there are protections in place, there's interest in protecting the cultural heritage and the agreement could certainly uh, be valuable uh, in, in accomplishing this. Thank you, and I hope you will uh, participate in the, uh, the effort uh, before the Cultural Property Advisory Committee. Thank you, James, and really thank you so much to all three of our speakers for sharing their expertise and experience today. After this, I'm ready to escape this winter weather and do some traveling, um, but we'll sh we're going to shift gears a little bit now. And I'm going to talk to you all about our advocacy campaign before asking our three panelists to join me to answer some questions for the audience if we have some time at the end. Um, so just bear with me for just a moment while I share my screen. Um, is that working? Yes. Okay. Great. Um, okay. First of all, I would like to note um, you do not need to have traveled to all three of these countries <laughs> to write a letter, nor do you need to address all three countries in a single letter. Um, and actually visiting the country is not a prerequisite to write a letter either. You may want to share your experiences with the cultural heritage of Cambodia, North Macedonia, or Uzbekistan based on a lecture you've attended or a museum ex exhibition you visited. Um, but if you have had experiences or interactions with the cultural heritage, of one of these three countries, we highly encourage you to spend a little bit of time in the next few days crafting a letter to advocate for its future. Um, these are slides from the how to, how to advocacy video we just posted to the AI YouTube channel earlier this week. Um, but since I have you all here, I'm going to quickly walk you through them. Um, what we have coming up at the end of this month is a meeting of the Cultural Property Advisory Committee. The President's Cultural Property Advisory Committee or CPAC is the American body empowered to make recommendations under the 1983 Convention on Cultural Property Implementation Act, um, which is how the United States fulfills the 1970 UNESCO Convention on the means of prohibiting and preventing the illicit import, export, and transfer of ownership of cultural property. The principal means of accomplishing this here in the United States is through five-year bilateral agreements between the U.S. and other countries. Um, before these agreements are signed or renewed, CPAC reviews written testimony from the public to determine whether countries are doing their part to protect their archaeological heritage and participate in cultural exchange. Um, and this is uh, what our speakers have been talking to, and this is where all of you joining us today come in. Um, your letter need not be long or complex, but this is a time-sensitive task. Letters are due this coming Monday, January 23rd, by 11.59 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we have some easy and effective strategies for crafting powerful letters to support of support for the U.S. Cultural Property Advisory Committee that I'm about to share with you, and you can get all this and some templates on the AIA website. Um, I think Katie's put it in the chat already, but she can throw it in there again if you need it. Um, we recommend a three-step approach to your letter. Um, so first you're gonna introduce yourself and talk about your connection to Cambodia, North Macedonia, or Uzbekistan. Um, in the past, in letters that I've sent to the Cultural Property Advisory Committee, I've talked about my experience visiting a country as an archeology span student, um, but also about some of the cultural exchanges I've had with the country since then, including uh, presentations I might have watched or traveling exhibits to U.S. museums that I've been able to visit. Uh, cultural, scientific, and educational exchange between the U.S. and the country the bilateral agreement is with is an important part of the committee's considerations, and I know all of our speakers have spoken to that a little bit as well. Um, Step two is to share your experience to illustrate what Cambodia, North Macedonia, or Uzbekistan is already doing to protect its whole archaeological heritage. Um, for example, you might talk about protections you saw in place at the uh, sites that you visited. 
You might remember other instances of signs at airports reminding passengers that taking home artifacts is illegal or various other mechanisms to secure access to sites that can take the form of anything from guards to fencing uh, to requiring licensed guides to accompany you at a site. Um, so, if, you know, think, think about uh, any kind of uh, mechanisms you saw, you know, personally to secure access to sites um, or protect museums. Uh, and then in step three, you want to end your letter by expressing your support for the bilateral agreement, which is often referred to as a memorandum of understanding between two countries. Um, and honestly, that's it. You need to submit your letter via the regulations gov website. I have a screenshot of it here, but you go in and you you um, type in the docket number. So, so for this one, it's DOS-2022-0048. Um, and this will pop up and you just click on the comment button right here. Um, and there's not a lot of time to do this. You can submit any time before 1159 Eastern on Monday, uh, January 23rd. Uh, that's this Monday. And letters can be typed into a comment box, or if you want to put it on your own letterhead or whatever, you can upload it as a PDF. Um, if you haven't copied it down already, check out the link in the AIA chat for the AIA page with more information where you can see sample letter templates, and you can also view the how-to video that goes over this information as well. Um, I've really enjoyed uh, taking a little bit of time with you today to learn about this process. Um, and in the next few days, if you can take the time to uh, use your voice to advocate for the preservation of archeological sites in Cambodia, North Macedonia, and or Uzbekistan, uh, we would so appreciate it. Um, and uh, yes, I'm going to now invite Tess, Matthew, and James to join me. And if you guys have some questions, if you want to, we have a few minutes to take questions. Great. We have, did anyone see any questions in the chat? Uh, well, we did have the one test that you kind of pre preemptively answered. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, Susan had a great question just about, um, you know, how do these agreements protect the archaeological remains? Tess, do you want to, you want to talk to that one for a couple sure. minutes? Sure, I can chime in on that, and I'm sure James has some things to add as well. But um, in brief, the United States remains the largest art market in the world. We make up around 45%, depending on what study you look at of the global art market. And so by taking action to close our borders to looted and stolen art from these three countries and others, it really has a global impact. Um, these agreements put into place import restrictions, um, basically meaning if you're bringing an artifact into this country, uh, sorry, into the United States from one of these countries, you would need to show that it left the country legally. Um, it does not, for that reason, impact the legal trade. If something is out of the country legally, um, you know, it's not covered by this agreement. The agreement only targets the illicit trade. And in addition to the import restriction, it also provides avenues for further bilateral cooperation and other agreements. We've seen this realized as, you know, encouraging museum exhibitions and loans, um, but even things like law enforcement training back and forth, for example, the FBI or Homeland Security investigations working with our, with our partners in other countries to conduct law enforcement training or bringing teams of professionals, um, be it law enforcement or museum professionals or archaeologists to the United States for training here. Um, so it res results in exchange of objects, but also in terms of people as well to try to strengthen these bilateral ties. Um, Professor Reap, is there anything that you would add to that? I'd just like, to, just like to pick up on a couple of your points. One is that I think that because of the role of the U.S. in the market and uh, the size of our economy, serving as an example can certainly be an, and has been an incentive for other countries to enter into similar agreements. Uh, with the countries that are, that are protected. And it opens up that collaborative partnership that you're talking about between our State Department, our National Park Service, and professionals in the U.S. to, to help them 
even uh, to to improve their programs um, and bring vi bring visitors to the U.S. So I think that those that those two reasons are, are excellent for, uh, for for entering into these agreements. Great. Um, do we, are there any other questions in the audience before we wrap up today? Um, otherwise, I think we just, uh, you know, <laughs> express that we would really love it if you send in a letter by Monday. Um, and I know that's a, a, some homework and not a lot of time, but um, you can get all of the links to submit the letters right on the right in the chat. Um, and yeah, that's it for today. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, go ahead and go to that regulations.gov website and, and put it put, put in your letter. Um, and also please consider supporting the AIA and our mission to advocate for the past by becoming a member of the AIA if you're not already. I think several of you are, um, but also or you by donating to support us. Um, we hope to see you at one of our programs soon um, and we will follow up with this with you'll get an email from us with a, a recording from today's presentation as well as the links in your email so thank you everyone and have a great afternoon.